Hello? All right, so good afternoon. We are going to get started. So I ask you all to take your seats. All right, so thank you so much for joining us in our inaugural Global Solutions Forum. Um, I am Maria Cortez Puig, the director of the networks program at SDSN. So just a brief introduction. SDSN has been working from 2012 under the auspices of the Secretary General of the UN, uh, mobilizing scientific and technical expertise um, in support of very practical solutions that can accelerate uh, the implementation of the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. Um, we, we pursue this mission uh, working with our members, and we have right now about uh, 1,100 members from over 100 countries. These members are mostly universities, but not just, and they organize themselves around national and regional networks. And um, we have 33 of these, um, 10 of them will be represented uh, today, but I invite you all to check our very newly published annual report, uh, Networks in Action, where you can find uh, information about the activities of all of the 33 uh, networks. Um, so very quickly about today's event. This event has been made possible by the very generous support of GIZ, uh, a partner of us for the last five years and supporting very strongly our networks. Also, thanks to GIZ, we've been able to uh, work with BrightWeb, a communications agency that ha has designed our very beautiful logo. And the way the, the workshop is going to work is that we will have uh, 10 presentations of 10 solutions that have been curated by our networks. These will be very brief presentations. Think about it as a, think about um, sort of a, a conversation starter. <laughs> Um, and then we'll have a reception that will give you the chance to talk in depth with all of the speakers about their solutions. Um, we will have a Q&A session, uh, but because we have such a brief time, we are going to be using Slido. So uh, you can log via your phone to Slido via this um, address and then with the code N977 you can post your questions and you can also vote on other people's questions and then we'll use that uh, to ask our, our presenters. Um, please also tweet, feel free to take pictures, tweet and use the hashtag uh, GSF19. So let's start with our first uh, presenter, Laura Cavalli from SDSN Italy, please. So good evening to everyone. I'm uh, Laura Cavalli, thanks for the introduction. I'm an economist uh, and I'm a senior researcher at Fondazioni Eni Enrico Mattei uh, based in Milan. At the same time, I'm manager of uh, SDSN Italia. I work on sustainable issues, uh, especially because uh, I have a daughter and a husband, and that's probably, you know what I mean. And, but above all, I'm here to present this uh, beautiful and interesting solution, <coughs> which is logistic of the future in sustainable smart ports. So this is an example of how partnership can really help catalyzing the localization of the SDGs, of the Agenda 2030. So before starting, uh, let's do a little step back. So keep in mind the first keyword I really would like you to bring home, localization. So yes, scaling down we know that is a really difficult task and it's really difficult to try to understand what we should do to reach this sustainability. Last year in Fondazione Eni we developed a quite <coughs> successful tool, so called SDSN Italia SDG City Index. It was meant to be a tool for policy maker. We really would like them to understand the state of the art of sustainability in their area, actually in their city. Then we create this great tool, wow, fantastic. But we localize it, really? Did we do? Are we sure about that? So now, I was talking about a really, really hard topic, which is um, we live in Italy, a really heterogeneous country from the social, economic, and demographic perspective. So probably was not enough. At the same time I was uh, struggling on this problem, I received a call from um, a colleague of mine 
the head of sustainability and corporate responsibility at Ericsson. Uh, she read the report, and at the same time, she was talking about the same issues. And exactly in that moment, she was working together with the Volno Port Authority, with uh, Telecom Italian Mobile, and the Consortium on Inter-University for Telecommunication, uh, on an innovative framework uh, to assist cargo port uh, handling their upcoming and future capacity. So actually, these two things <coughs> are connected. Localization means developing frameworks to work with. So we started reasoning together. But you all know that things are complex, and this is the second key word I really would like you to remember. That's why we start reasoning together on one single aim, <coughs> one goal, localize. Complex because we were five, five different shareholders, uh, non-profit international research center, public authority, private company. And there was really complexity in the way we would like and we used to solve problems. Complexity <laughs> because the issue we wanted to disentangle. Of course, the Agenda 2030 is complex itself. Here are some numbers. You know that 169 are the targets of the Agenda 2030. Mm -hmm. And we had to match this target with the 38 <laughs> activities of the Harbour process uh, for the port city sustainability. Other numbers, 74% of goods entering or leaving Europe go by sea. 1.5 million workers are employed in European ports. And 147 million tons of <coughs> CO2 equivalent is the impact, is the impact of the maritime transportation in European Union in 2018, so last year. Complexity because of the 65 5G benefits identified for the port area related to the 2030 agenda also able to help cities and the communities to reach uh, the sustainable development and have a potential impact of 50% of saving <coughs> in CO2 emission. Was there a way to lighten this complexity? Yes, working together. So sharing ideas, sharing doubts, uh, solutions help us really to overcome the existing obstacles. So the twist and turn of the project uh, occurred at the time when we all make <coughs> our knowledge available to the others. So the joint effort had another really interesting advantage. So our initial hypothesis we had with brainstorming, uh, while concern we had that, were confirmed by the results. But what did we obtain at the end of the journey? So we developed a model with a set of innovative KPIs for the port which consider the digital transformation enabled by the 5G as the main driver, the main lever for both the port performance and valuation and to portray sustainable development. We did that by scaling down the agenda 2030, linking its content uh, with a strategic decision to promote the sustainability within the port city area. We therefore provided a deep analysis of the enabling power of the 5G technologies in order to evolve port process in the direction of international agenda. And finally, we applied a model to the Livorno port, thanks to the data we had, highlighting the 5G positive impact for four main SDGs. SDG 8, competitiveness and more safety for workers. SDG 11, sustainable growth for the port city. SDG 12, responsible business in logistics. And SDG 13, so estimated environmental impact was equal to 8.2% saving of CO2. It means almost 148,000 kilos of CO2. Oh, what's that? <laughs> That's not only for the birthday, first birthday of the Agenda 2030, that is exactly today, but it's just to remind us that this saving CO2 emission means exactly, not more or less, 37,747,538 party balloons full of CO2. That's a quite huge number, isn't it? So let me add another key point. The relevance not only to consider the Agenda 2030 made only of environmental, social, and economic side, which is a unicorn to be considered, but also to ensure a strong institutional commitment, as well as steady public endorsement. As a researcher, we develop models, mm -hmm. but they must be useful at policy level and publicly recognized for population. Let me be more clear. Put yourself for a moment uh, in the shoes of the Livorno port. So this was the initial issue. Should the port invest in new technology? 
it firmly believed that a model was needed. The public-private research we did discussed and developed the framework uh, with a subsequent application of the model, and we offered the Port Authority the tool for developing a plan and make a final decision about a possible investment, a responsible investment. That's the last key word I want to stress. So, Agenda 2030, local priorities, innovation, technologies, environmental, social, economic issue, responsible investment, these are all keywords to bring home. As Papa Francesco said, we still have the possibility and the ability to solve the problems of our times, and this by working together for our common home. Our solutions seem to be a pretty good attempt to welcome the challenge. Thank you. SDSM Caribina. Thank you, Maria. Thanks, everyone. I'm Dr. Legina Henry from the University of the West Indies in Cave Hill, Barbados. I'm an MIT trained mechanical engineer and now working on renewable energy questions in the Caribbean. Um, okay, so Roman Sargassum is a little more fun than Roman Cook. But so let's talk about it for the next seven minutes. Okay. Um, Caribbean nations pay the highest energy bills in the world because of fossil fuel dependency and the high cost of shipping fossil fuels to all of these small islands. Um, our team, a group of students, they're all seated in the third row, we brainstormed and tested a biofuel solution this summer to the transportation and energy needs of Barbados. Um, our data analysis this summer kind of showed us that the decline in sugarcane industry in Barbados would not be enough to sustain a biofuel um, industry as a feedstock for the national energy demand. We were trying to model Brazil and scale it down to Barbados, and it, it didn't seem to be promising, so then we deliberated. All right, so this is, a group, this is the group of scientists, and this is some of the equipment we had on campus brainstorming this biofuel solution for Barbados. So let me tell you a story. Well, let's start in the history of the Caribbean. Caribbean countries are unique in that most of the populations comprise of the descendants of West Africans that were brought over to the Western Hemisphere as captured slaves. So I put the triangular trait there as a reminder from history. So this triangle had three passages. The first passage took men, uh, sorry, took product from Europe refined product from Europe to West Africa. The second passage, which we call the Middle Passage, brought captured men and women from the coast of West Africa to the Caribbean islands. And the third passage took raw agricultural product from the Caribbean to Europe to be refined and marketed for, for um, distribution around the world. All right, so thus the triangle thrived for three centuries. Um, there was a saving grace in the story and it was rum. The rum industry grew out of waste from the sugarcane industry. And because it was waste, it stayed in the islands. But the beauty of it is the rum industry grew out of the islands and now the international rum industry is dominated by Caribbean rum. Um, another beauty about the rum industry is the wastewater it produces is optimal for producing biofuel because of the high chemical oxygen demand of wastewater from the rum. And every day, thousands of liters of rum distillery waste fluid is produced in the Caribbean and can be used for biofuel. Right now, it's just kind of tossed into the ocean. Okay. Um, biomethane can cheaply and easily power electric grids and power vehicles. So a regular internal combustion engine car, which I think most of the people in this room drive, could be readily converted to a CNG engine using a CNG conversion kit, and thus it's able to drive fully on biomethane. Um, and that's being done all around the world right now. Barbados has an extensive natural gas grid, so that's the second graphic. Um, and actually, this grid can be retrofitted for biogas as Barbados transitions to 100% renewable energy by the year 2030. Um, anaerobic digestion of any biological feedstock can be um, used towards methane production. 
It's a multi-step process, but the most important step is hydrolysis, the first step. And that takes a lot of water. Um, Barbados and a lot of Caribbean islands are water scarce. So the rum distillery waste idea is perfect because that's thousands of liters of wastewater produced every day on these islands. Okay, so we looked at published numbers from Brazil and Barbados and made some kind of analysis to do comparisons. And you can see on the plot on the right, the number, this is the sugarcane produced in Barbados compared to Brazil, um, scaled by production in the year 2007. And as you could see, sugarcane is on the decline in Barbados. So um, we needed another feedstock in, based on the numbers. So Brittany, the student at the front right, she came up with the, uh, she was driving home on a taxi and she saw huge mounds of sargassum seaweed on the beach and cranes removing these mounds of sargassum seaweed to take them off to the landfill. And she thought, why don't we look at sargassum seaweed? So she came into the lab and said, let's try sargassum. And I said, sure, let's try sargassum. So um, interestingly enough, in the most poetic turn of events, let me tell you about sargassum. This is an image from no NASA Earth Observatory. Um, the sargassum seaweed is now traversing the same middle passage. It's leaving the coast of West Africa. It's coming across the Atlantic Ocean and it's inundating the Caribbean Sea because of runoff from South and North America. There's this massive bloom right at the Caribbean Sea. So um, right now, sargassum maps show that it's actually producing more biomass than, any, than the total of these islands ability to produce biomass. There's more biomass than we could produce on these tiny islands, okay? After weeks of thinking about sugarcane, though, and history and everything, when I saw this 2018 map produced by Brooks in Maryland, um, it reminded me of that other triangle. So I thought, what an interesting story, and I decided to tell the story this way. All right, so what did we do in the lab? We harvested some sargassum from the south coast of Barbados and we put it in the lab with different rum distillery fluids from rum distilleries around Barbados and looked at different conditions of producing biofuel. And so what did our results show? Well, the results are in and they're good. Combined with rum distillery waste from two of the bigger distilleries in Barbados, we found that the methane output was comparable to any standard grasses, the output that we saw in Barbados before and in other parts of the world. So this here is just the rum, this, sorry, this is the natural gas grid of Barbados. Right now it's in uh, the yellow dots show where the rum distilleries are along the grid. Three of the four major distilleries are actually located within the LNG grid. And so we are proposing a project where we put down pilots on all of the four distilleries, produce biomethane and test it on CNG converted cars in the next year and a half. Uh, the estimated total of our project, a future project is 94,000 US dollars. Right now, it seems like this, this idea touches on all the sustainable development goals. And I think it seems like Mother Earth's reparations to these free people now, children of former slaves. Um, it's within the writing of a historic wrong, and it's the beginning of the end of an antagonistic journey from the coast of West Africa to the islands of the Caribbean. Thank you for listening. <laughs>Good afternoon, I'm Aurelien Descamps uh, from SDS in France. I'm a professor at Catch Business School and also the co-founder of an NGO called Sulitest, which is developing online tool to raise awareness on sustainability issues. 
At Sulitest, we truly believe that if we want to build a sustainable future, we need to raise awareness on sustainability issue beyond the ones who are already convinced. Our mission statement is to achieve sustainability literacy for all. The Sulitest story starts at Rio Plus 20, where we were um, really active in the launch of HESI, the Higher Education Sustainability Initiative. This initiative, the spirit of this initiative is to acknowledge that if sustainability issues mostly come from human decision, often taken in a professional context, as higher education institution, we bear a responsibility. Initiative endorsed by several UN agencies, also international networks such as SDSN, more than 300 uh, higher education institutions agreed to put sustainability into the teaching, into the research, into the campus management. And very quickly, a key question arises. How do we make sure that what we are doing have actually an impact on our students and graduate awareness on sustainability? This is how the first and main tool of SULI test was born, a sustainability literacy test an online test available for any university or other organization to make sure that their students, staff, faculty members, leaders have the sufficient level of awareness to understand the challenges. This tool is now widely sh shared with more than 125,000 test takers from something like 30 countries. Uh, and the resource available online has improved. In addition to an international module, which is the same in every country and cover the whole scope of the 17 SDGs, we have now 27 regional committees, uh, which have or are at the moment developing their own country-specific modules. And we have four SDG-specific modules co-created with different uh, UN agencies. As SULITEST is spread, the tool is used to raise awareness, but it also contributes to build a first database on the evolution of the awareness of sustainability issue. This is why every year we report at the UN High Level Political Forum uh, to map the advancement of the, uh, of the SDG awareness with the SULI test results. So this was the first tool that we developed, and by co-creating the question with this community of mostly universities, uh, we realized that creating relevant questions with meaningful learning statement with reli reliable sources is actually a strong pedagogical exercise. <coughs> Some universities have used it by asking their students, for example, at the end of a course, instead of taking a test, where well, if you understood the key concept of this course, you should be able to create the question that should be on the test at the end. At the same time, through the test, we want to crowdsource the, the creation of the questions that are used in the tool. So this is how we had the idea of launching this pedagogical interface, which is called Looping by Sully Test, to conduct reverse pedagogy for the SDGs. So why do we need reverse pedagogy? We think that the complexity of the SDGs uh, are a perfect example of why we need to rethink pedagogy. First, we need to adapt. We need to question ourselves. We need to question the way we learn. We know that there are no unique or simple solution to complex issues. So we must ask the good question rather than searching for a simple answer. We also need to use collective intelligence to co-create new knowledge, new pedagogical experience, and going out of a discussion only between experts. And finally, we need to, to foster active learning to engage the youngest generation so that they can be active in the pedagogy, in the change in the pedagogy, and so that they can be active in uh, creating new solutions for the SDGs. So we created this new pedagogical interface, looping by Sully Test, to conduct reverse pedagogy. This interface will be put online on the Sully Test platform and made available for any educators for free, uh, any SDG ambassador, any facilitator uh, who wants to conduct reverse pedagogy to engage a learning path through the SDGs. 
the platform allows for uh, peer learning and peer, uh, peer evaluation, sorry, uh, so that uh, we can use critical thinking. And it also comes with pedagogical kits. We have a pedagogical scenario, we have resources for teachers, and also feedback from previous session uh, using this platform. And finally, you can adapt this platform to your own learning goals. You can use it to learn about the whole scope of the SDGs, for example, and their multiple interlinkages. You can also use it to connect your own expertise to the SDGs. My background is economics. I know that we need to rethink economics if we want to answer the SDGs. So I can use that with my students to find out what are the 20, 30 questions that are absolutely necessary uh, to rethink economics for the SDGs. As in every tool in the Sully Test platform, we use always the same methodology. We prototype, we beta test the tool, and then we put it online available for the community and we continuously improve with the community. So we have prototyped this looping by Sully Test platform. We have beta tested in Catch Business School through SDS in France. Uh, and the platform has proven to be a good engagement tool for students and a nice tool for teachers to engage in uh, reverse pedagogy. We will now put it available online on sulites.org. So my key takeaway message for you is use it. Use it to engage in uh, SDG learning. And of course, you can also support it. Sulites is a nonprofit platform. Uh, we develop online tools to put that online for free. So of course, we also need to fund this. So you are very welcome uh, on that part. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention and let's build a sustainable future together. Thank you, Aurelien. The Sully test is a great complement to the SDG Academy that I'm sure several of you know. Um, the Academy creates and curates uh, very high quality MOOCs uh, on topics of the SDG. What I personally love about the Academy is that not only you get to take a course with these amazing professor that you've always admired, but you also interact with them, as well as with people from around the world. We have people from the SDG Academy here today, including Chandrika Bahadur, that is the president of the SDSN Association, and others, so feel free to reach out to them also at the end of the, of the, of the presentation in the reception. So let's get our next speaker from SDSM Malaysia, uh, Ong Pang Yen, please. Thank you, and then uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have to change this, all right. Uh, my name is Ong Pang Yen. I bring you greetings from uh, Malaysia. I'm an engineer by profession. I'm here today to share with you how a township developer in Malaysia has embraced all 17 of the SDGs and is doing its part to help promote the agenda of the SDG back home in Malaysia. Because of time constraint, I would only touch on the environmental aspects of the SDGs. Yeah? Well, I think uh, we all know the uh, world population has grown tremendously over the past century. And with that, uh, there's more uh, deforestation happening because we need more land for agriculture. There are more mining activities taking place to support the need for economic growth and simply to build more houses to, to house the increased uh, populace. And with uh, rapid urbanization, inevitably, the focus today is on sustainable city. In Malaysia alone, uh, since the 1970s, it was estimated that about 400 square kilometers of land were converted to build new cities and for urban expansion. Uh, it is unfortunate that uh, this trespassing of urbanization is happening uh, despite an increasing abundance in the wasteland created by economic activities such as tin mining in Malaysia. Malaysia used to be the largest tin exporter in the world. And it is very unfortunate, uh, you know, that uh, after taking so much from the belly of the earth, uh, this land are left abandoned. Uh, this is simply because to rehabilitate this land, it is usually very costly and prohibitive. And so they are usually left as wasteland. But can we do better? 
what you see here today on the screen is a map, uh, is a photograph of uh, what used to be a tin mine in Selangor in Malaysia. And this is what it is today. Another angle, uh, this is a tin mine. Uh, nothing grows there because of the mining process. Every nutrient has been washed out. You can't even find a uh, an earthworm living there. And this is what it is today. More than 25,000 trees have been transplanted and an ecosystem restored. Communities built and the wasteland transformed into a wonderland. This is how it looks uh, today if you come to Malaysia, Sunway City. On the environmental aspect, just as you know, nations came together for the 2016 uh, Paris Agreement, uh, committing to take concrete steps to reduce greenhouse gas emission, likewise, cities must also do uh, the same. And this is where the model of an integrated mixed-use township play a very important role in uh, cutting down CO2 emission in a mixed-use development where one can live, learn, work, play, do their daily chores at the same uh, township without a need to commute beyond the township, CO2 emission is very much reduced. The average uh, car mileage traveled by a family living in a township like this is very much lower than those who are living in dedicated uh, residential uh, precincts or suburbs. And then comes the infrastructure. In, the, in Sunray City, we have uh, a, a network of elevated covered walkways, very comfortable, very safe for people to walk. So once you are in the township, there's no need to move about by cars. And we have electric bus elevated as well. As far as uh, renewable energy is concerned, uh, we have solar panels on rooftops. At the moment, we are generating about 2% of what we require for the township. The target is 5%. Uh, we treat our own water localization. We treat our own water. That negates the need to pump water from distant reservoir to the township. And these uh, initiatives or these uh, actions alone uh, is equivalent to planting about 300,000 trees You know, in terms of the CO2 emission that is uh, being uh, reduced. This township is built on what is uh, known as a build-own-operate uh, model. But I must say that the ownership model, even though it is very advantageous because we have control, it was not by choice back then. Because back then, bankers and investors would usually just shy away, asking, you know, uh, can't you find an easier piece of land to build your township? Uh, so it was a very difficult uh, time back then because gearing is very high. A lot of investment into uh, education, into uh, healthcare, and all the other retail, leisure, hospitality industries. These have got very long gestation period, a very long payback period. So when two recessions hit the country, the group almost went under. Uh, but uh, thankfully, uh, because of the perseverance of the founder and the chairman of the group, uh, because of the values that he has, he has adopted, integrity, humility, and excellence, uh, the group managed to convert uh, some stakeholders into shareholders. And so there's no looking back after these two uh, very tough uh, recessions. But cities in the future are not uh, built because of the infrastructure that we have. It's not buildings and roads and bridges. It must be built around its communities for it to be sustainable. And there are two communities that we focus on in uh, Sunway City, healthcare professionals, uh, academics, and uh, researchers. Uh, this is very important because uh, we, we, we not only uh, need to do what is right, but we also must learn to do the right things right. And uh, these two communities would uh, help us in this uh, regard. So we have the Jeffrey Sachs Center in Sunway City. Uh, we have uh, research uh, with top universities uh, in the world. It is to be a living laboratory, and it is to be, we aspire to be a center, a regional center of excellence for our community. The call to action is to challenge government and developers to consider building on non-arable, <coughs> degraded land. Imagine if 10% uh, of uh, urban expansion or cities are built on non-arable and degraded land. What if 20% are being built on such land? We should reclaim and rehabilitate land. 
We need to translate awareness into concrete actions. Uh, just last week, I was in Bangkok with a group of uh, uh, asset managers and fund managers, and they're all talking about ESG, Responsible Investment. That's a very good thing. You know, awareness must be translated into uh, concrete and affirmative action. Uh, finally, uh, we need partners because there's still so much that we can leverage on one another, so much that we can learn from another to achieve uh, the goals. And that's why we are here together in the network. Uh, I would like to leave you with this quote uh, by the founder and chairman who made uh, this transformation possible in Malaysia. Achieving the SDGs is not the responsibility of governments alone. It requires the commitment of all sectors of society, the private sector, academia, civil society, and every single individual. We are all in this together. And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me remind you that we're, we have Slido going on, so feel free to ask, to start popping your questions there. The number is N977. And then also please use the hashtag. So our next speaker comes from SDSN Amazonia, Karina Pinasco Vela. Hi everyone, my name is Karina Pinasco. I was born in Peruvian Amazon, but I also a nature lover by vocation and by conviction. I'm from a small town called Huanhui. Then I walk it free in forests. I enjoy swimming in rivers until I was nine years old when the violence that tore apart where I was to live. I study biology and forest conservation to come back to my land and to work for sustainability in our Amazon. And in this mission, together with many great parents, partners, we decide to work on voluntary and communal conservation and look for solutions for development for inside. But we have a great challenge ahead. The Amazon in Peru is blending out. 170,000 hectares per year are being deforested. This deforestation is not only caused by illegal activities. It is for the production of non-native foods, such as rice, palm, or coffee, and others. The emergency is even greater in this time of climate change. In August only, it is estimated that we lost more than 2 million hectares of forest in the Amazon, caused by burning, fire, and bad political and economical decisions. We are living a climate emergency. This is a tragedy. But the forest, the Amazon, is, provides us with ecosystem service, such as water, oxygen, and medicine. But it's a source of sustainable food, the forest doesn't need anything, it is there for us. That's why we decide to work on conservation with added tool that is called gastronomy or sustainable gastronomy. An innovative and revolutionary tool that gives value to biodiversity on our cultural and natural world. And to demonstrate that the standing forest is more profitable than cut down. Part of our work consists in getting to cooks together with the communities in order to create a collaborative knowledge synergy. With the economy or circular economic approach, we work to use cocoa waste, giving value by products like musilagu, honey, and has flour. This made is possible to stabilize agriculture without needing to, co to cut down the forest anymore and to reduce emissions. In Peru, there is more than 250,000 hectares of cocoa crops. In short, 150 products of the Amazon in 45 restaurants. Thanks to local 
innovative technologies, we are helping to reduce by 40% the wage production cost for sustainable use for pulp and oil. Peru has almost 7 million hectares of natural plantation of aguaje. It's crazy not to work with it. In the Andean part of the Amazon, we are working with a quinoa, a superfood, and with honey, reduced infant malnutrition. We'll create 1,500 jobs. We are there used to the poverty. Now, there is a huge opportunity. Science, we work with conservation agreements. We have reduced the pressure of our ecosystems. 137 communal and voluntary conservation initiative. We're working in the Amazon regions where 1.5 million hectares are being conserved with a civil society. This represents a saving $4 million for the Peruvian states per year where we are more than 11,000 custodians of the forest. There are more and more consumers looking for a taste of conservation, wanting sustainable products that improve the quality of life, the population, and conserve forests. We are contributing to the achievement of five sustainable development goals. And most importantly, happy people. People who are, who are proud of our roots, proud of what we are. We have a great potential, and is, this is what we want to tell the world. We know that we are on the right path. We know that we can make a change. We are on a way to savor with creativity a change of mentalities about the value of our ecosystems. Gastronomy makes is possible for us to generate benefits for the communities. Those are concrete benefits, but we need more. We need you. We need each and every one of us. If we love what we are, if we love what we have, the conservation is ensured. There are many ways, many ways to add up to change. The first one is to be conscious consumers about what we eat every day. Each meal can make difference between a conserved forest and cut down forest. There are many, uh, moreover, if you want to help, here are two more concrete ways to join work. The first one is donated to the Communal and Voluntary Conservation Network, Amazonia Quelate. 11,000 custodians expect your support. The second one is ASLA por la Amazonia, campaign in which we intend to restore and repair the great areas in order to reduce the impact of the recent forest fire. The challenge, one, plant one million trees in 2020. We can do it. It's possible. Thank you so much for helping to conserve life, to share it with everyone. Thank you so much, Karina. Um, the chairs of the Amazon SDSN are here today. This network is profoundly worried about the crisis going on in the Amazon. And this is a wonderful initiative ha happening under the umbrella of this network, but there are many more. So reach out to Emma Torres or Virgilio Viana in the reception. Um, the very latest of these initiatives is uh, a meeting, a, a group of top-notch scientists from the region that are going to be identifying means to save the Amazon. And this uh, has just been put together as, as, as recently as last Sunday. So let me now invite our next speaker, the chair of our, uh, our Nigerian SDSN, Labo de Popola. Good evening, everybody. My name is Labo de Popola. I'm a resource economist, forest resource economics to be precise. I've been teaching and researching forest economics and sustainable development for the past uh, 30 years or so 
Now I'm the chair of the network in Nigeria. What do we intend to do? Uh, we intend to create, oh sorry, move too fast maybe. Yes, we intend to create a data platform for the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria. Nigeria is a very big country, uh, perhaps as big as the UK and two other countries in Europe put together. And um, we want a situation where we can capture and harmonize all the data about development and put them in one bit and also be able to have an interactive platform where we can actually compare development across the six geopolitical zones of the country. And this will enable us to evaluate development from time to time, uh, even in the whole country. Nigeria has been around for a while, and uh, we've been having development uh, um, plans uh, for some 50 years, close to 50 years now. But most of the time, there is a disconnect between these development plans and the actual development. And so we believe that if we are able to have um, uh, a development pattern that will ensure that we capture all the data about development, it will be able to help us to connect with the citizens of the country. Now, we also expect that crafting an interactive platform for data decentralization across the geopolitical zone will also enhance development. Uh, we also know that there is a global support for implementation of the SDGs, and monitoring is key to uh, the support. Now, uh, initial worries when we attempted this uh, project, we need, knew that we had insufficient time to conduct a countrywide study because of the size of Nigeria. And we also had a challenge in selecting the six states that we needed to use. And we asked ourselves some questions. First, on what basis will states across the zones be selected? There are 36 states and the capital territory making 37. So which of these states should we select? And how many people out of almost 200 million people are we going to interview to be able to get the information we require? Now, the stakeholders that we engaged in the process included local government chairmen. Uh, they are the lowest level of governance in the country. Traditional rulers, very influential people in the country. Uh, we also use sustainable development uh, desk officers. These are relatively senior research uh, uh, personnel in the universities. We also used um, field assistants, early career researchers. We also use rural and uh, urban residents across the different uh, demographic groups. Now, lessons that we learned in the process, uh, we had fairly wide differences between needs in rural and urban areas. Then we also had rural and urban residents uh, who are willing to contribute to the process of sustainable development. And there were some surprises. The first one is that there was low level of awareness of the SDGs in rural communities and even in some urban centers, of course also in some universities. Available resources are not yet put in optimal use. Nigeria is a typical example of the paradox of plenty. So many resources, both natural and otherwise, but we have not been able to put it to very good uses. We also made some mistakes. Some of the initially selected states actually were similar in many uh, uh, circumstances, particularly in the area of uh, social and economy. And uh, we had to decide to use a more purposive selection process to be able to get the work done. Our early findings included the fact that uh, the priority SDGs for northern Nigeria, uh, particularly the rural and semi-rural areas of that zone, are uh, SDG 3, SDG 4, and SDG 8. In the southern part of the country, uh, we discovered that SDG 6 and SDG 7 are priority. Now, this is not to say that the other SD, SDGs are also not important. All of them are important, particularly SDG 1, SDG 2, and SDG 16. But these are the priority ones we decided on. Now, we, out of our respondents, males comprise about 66.43%, while females were about 35.57%. 
Now, the proportion of respondents between the ages of 18 and 25 were 18.88. Those between 26 and 49 were 62.94. And those over 50 are 18.18. Some of the discoveries included the fact that when conducting a needs assessment for a community, various sections of that populace must be included. Uh, we uh, discovered that uh, quite late in the study. Now, this work also will provide a valid insight uh, for government at different tiers on needed local support for actualization of the SDGs. And we also believe that researchers, NGOs, uh, community-based organizations, civil society organizations will find our results very useful. Call to action. Support needed. In order to develop appropriate initiatives in each of the geopolitical zones, we think we will need about a, a $1 million uh, because of the size and population of the country and the complexity of that country also. And the takeaway from our effort is that the challenges are quite grave. For instance, at the moment, we have about 13.2 million children who need to be in school. They're already out of school. And for our next steps, work with states and non-state actors to advance the solutions through the identified needs. I want to thank you. Thank you very much, Labode. Um, I invite now our colleagues from SDS in Switzerland, Daria Gerasimenko and uh, Erika uh, Mansegol castillo Good evening, dear friends. What our society would look like and feel like if it would be governed by the values of kindness, compassion, gratitude, trust, and unconditional love. We would like to invite you to dream with us for a moment. Just going into our heart and sense, how would that feel to live in such a world? Would that be nourishing, healing? We are Erika from Impact Hub, Switzerland. And Daria, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Lausanne. And today we represent SDSN Switzerland. And this vision brought us together for a beautiful experience. And we would like to share with you today the story uh, of exploring a pathway towards such a society, as well as the main insights that we learned from it. This is an awareness-led social innovation lab about circular economy in Canton Vaux, Switzerland. It is about SDG 12 on responsible consumption and production and SDG 17 on meaningful partnerships. It's also about learning how to co-create spaces where root cause of the problems could be listened to and addressed. This is an emerging cross sector partnership where one organization's weaknesses is the other one's strengths. We were SDSN Switzerland, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, Impact Hub Geneva and Impact Hub Lausanne, Collaborato Helvetica, a Swiss social enterprise, and we were supported by the Swiss Foundation Migro Engagement. Economic development has been traditionally approached through policies, finance, trade, technologies. However, such important elements as silos, mindsets, human patterns of the behavior that are central for sustainable transformations, they do require new approaches. One of them would be social app space and awareness-led practices to support that transformation. We were a hosting team of five responsible for design, facilitation, harvesting, and graphic recording. And these were the 21 people of all backgrounds sectors and ages who took part in the lab. There is so little clarity on how to steer this complex partnership to orchestrate the diversities of this level and to introduce the awareness dimension into the co-creation process. 
there is no structure and no past experience to build from. We learned to reconnect to our original commitment, and that was to make it work, even if it was blurry. And we also learned to trust, whatever trust means in all its dimensions. A majority of participants have no experience with the tools and methods we propose. Some are skeptical about mindfulness. We learned that trust is the key. And we can only gain trust by manifesting ourselves what we're talking about. So we are, as a co-hosting team, had to work on our own egos to transform ourselves to be able to hold space for the others. And it does require patience and courage to show vulnerability. Our transformative learning journey is four months long with six workshops along the way. What if people drop out? Well, and that happened. And we value each individual choice the way it is. And we are happy to continue to explore with those who are ready for it. So what did we experience? Remember, at the beginning, the mindfulness sessions made some people uncomfortable. And at last, the same people reported transformational changes in mindsets, as well as a tremendous appreciation for that experience. So true. And remember our prototypes, which emerged th th through this experience. Three out of four were related to services to support people's knowledge, interaction, and exchange on circular economy and sustainability. And that has nothing to do with what we as co-hosting team originally predetermined as topics for this social app that was circular economy in water, in plastics, and electronics. So it's so exciting to see the serendipity element unfolding in such spaces. I am now convinced more than ever that we cannot solve our problems using the same type of thinking that created them. Awareness-based practices and methods such as mindfulness, theory you, art of hosting, dragon dreaming and others are essential in order to discover true human potential and to dive into the root cause of the world's challenges. And yeah, if this was just a prototype, can you imagine the potential of such spaces to foster a new type and a new quality of partnerships? There is so much healing that needs to be done at all the levels in our societies. Individual, collective, multi-generational traumas which need to be addressed and healed in order to advance on SDGs. Would such awareness-led social spaces be a part of the solution? Marcel Proust, French um, novelist, famous French novelist, noted that real voyage of discoveries consist not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. So imagine if we would look at the world with the eyes of love. We must continue to share this knowledge through presentations, media, publications, not only in Switzerland and Russia, but now USA, and who knows, maybe more. We would like to express our gratitude to everyone who has supported us on the way. To the people who we already mentioned here, we would like to add Felix Steli, uh, Nora Wilhelm, Professor Bruno Oberle, Michael Bergo, and Jorge Tomaya in Switzerland, who is with us today, and many other people. As well, we would like to thank all who didn't support us back then, because we learned a lot from that, how to bridge diversity, how to build bridges. Einstein famously said, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on the solution, I would spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. For once I know the proper question, I can solve the problem in less than five minutes. Do our societies master the art of asking questions? We would like to conclude our message today with the following question. How can we explore together the potential of awareness-led social spaces for healing co-creation of solutions where serendipity can emerge to show what is truly needed? Thank you very much for your attention.
very much. Um, so I'm going to invite our next speaker to join, and I'm going to stick around to see if he has been as inspired as, as me, and I get a hug from that. <laughs> so Martin, Bis uh, Martin Eriksson from SDSN Northern Europe. <laughs> Oh, yeah, this is mine, this is mine. <laughs> <coughs> so I guess first I need to thank Daria and Erika for giving a presentation that makes beautiful women want to give me a hug. <laughs> Thanks for that. Maybe you can come to all the conferences I, I go to and give a presentation before me. That, <laughs> is that something? Uh, okay, uh, hello everybody, good afternoon. My name is Martin Eriksson. Um, I, am the, I live in Sweden and I am the network manager for SDS in Northern Europe. And I'm here, oh, I need to forward the slides. Yeah, so, uh, I'm here to present to you today um, a tool we've been working on called the STG Impact <coughs> Assessment Tool. Um, as you all know, the 17 SDGs are integrated and indivisible. Uh, Still, uh, sorry, still a common strategy among many stakeholders is to cherry pick some of the SDGs, show their positive impacts on those, um, and I would say that is simply not good enough. We would need also to identify and address negative impacts and knowledge gaps. And furthermore, we need to stop playing whack the mole with the SDGs. We shouldn't solve one problem and at the same time create a new one. So, how can we evaluate if a solution can help to achieve the SDGs? Can we develop an approach to do this in a structural way? I think we can. Furthermore, we need broad participation. In addition to governments and big companies, we also need small-scale companies, civil society, universities, to understand how they impact the SDGs. And we need to do this at the global scale. So uh, the tool here will help companies or other organizations to do self-assessments of the impacts they have on SDGs. And the methodology we recommend contains five steps. Ideally, first you gather your forces and perform an assessment in a workshop format. Then you define, refine, and frame the solution that you assess. You sort the SDGs just to get the discussion started in the group. Then you do the actual SDG impact assessment, which I will show you in a minute. And given the results of that, you formulate the strategy forward. So now I will try to switch to and show you the tool itself, if I can manage that. OK, where am I? I'm here. No. Here, sorry. OK, let's see. Aha, uh -huh. I'm not supposed to show your film again. <laughs> so I guess I'm, yeah, here we are. Um, so this is how the website looks like. Um, at the top here, you see that there's an about and an instructions page, and they contain exactly what the name suggests. We don't have to go through that now. Um, so you simply sign up down here with an email address, and when you get an email popping up in your inbox, inbox, you click on that link, and then you're good to go. So there's no special membership, there's no fees coupled to this. This is a free resource for all people on the planet. So now I will log in, and I have made some example assessments uh, to illustrate the electrification of cars. I don't have so much time, so I will try to do this quickly. I will then to make an assessment, just click on any of these SDGs that you see here. Let's do SDG 13. Um, so here you have a brief introduction, the official introduction to that SDG. You, of course, have a very useful link here to this SDG. And, and below that, you see that the targets are listed. Um, and further down comes the step where you do an assessment. So here, when we talk about electrification of cars, you have to determine then if there is a direct negative, an indirect negative. <coughs> Maybe there is actually no impact on this SDG. There can also be an indirect positive or direct positive impact. Or you actually don't know whether a solution has an impact on a specific SDG. 
So for now, I will simply say that there is a direct positive impact on SDG 13 for replacing combustion engines with batteries in cars. So this is an easy click exercise, as you can see. But the important part comes here. So now we need to motivate our categorization here. So here's where you provide your reasoning, qualitative, quantitative reasoning. You can put in data, models, whatever you want. You document how you reason about this, provide references and scientific support. Uh, so for now, I will write something here that is much less stringent than what I just said. Um, then I save this assessment. And uh, for, to be able to show you some results, I have sort of a ready-baked cake here. Uh, and here you can see that the 17 goals are already completed. And you can then look at the results. Before that, you can't. So you need to address all the SDGs. Um, so as you can see, this the resulting figure here is almost like a map of impact on the SDGs from this particular solutions. So at the top, can I use this? Well, maybe I can do it this way instead. At the top here, you have the positive impacts. In the middle row, you have the absence of impacts for the respective SDGs. At the bottom, you have the negative impacts. And then broken out at the, at the bottom here is, is the knowledge gaps that we need to address in some way. And given these results that we see here, we have to formulate the strategy forward. So this is the last step in the methodology. Which positive impacts can you strengthen? Can you mitigate or eliminate, minimize some of the negative impacts? And what do you need to do to fill the knowledge gaps? So this, we believe, uh, can be a starting point for a more comprehensive sustainability strategy for a smaller corporation or company or, or other organization, for that matters. In the end, you can print the total output from the tool, including the resulting figure, the description, the motivations, and, and also the strategy forward as a PDF. So let me get back to my presentation, if I can handle a Mac computer. OK, good. So I want to talk a little bit how this tool has been applied. Um, in SDS in Northern Europe, we have something we call Solutions Initiative Forum. So this is an event, and we also write a report coupled to those. Um, we have uh, done three such events and reports. As you can see, you can download them from our website, um, SDS and Northern Europe website, not the tool. Um, we have done, so this essentially covers 60 solutions that we've done in these events. The tool has also been used in research projects, for example, on uh, net zero greenhouse, SDG impacts from net zero greenhouse gas emissions in Sweden. And another area which we think this tool is very useful for is in sustainability education. So students can learn about the SDGs while they evaluate a company or an organization or some initiative of some sort. Perhaps a company that they are working on anyway in the course. You just plug in this tool in the curricula and they get sustainability also, so to speak. So we are doing precisely this at Chalmers University of Technology and Gothenburg University uh, in Sweden. So my simple call to action is use the tool. Try it out, use it, and of course spread the word about it. We are actually already planning for the next version where we would like to include more flexibility and more functions. It would, for example, be very nice if you can share assessments with one another, with your colleague, and work independently on them. It would also be fantastic if you could choose to make your assessment searchable public and searchable, and also include, oh, I had to wrap up, also include a reviewing system would be great, right? So we can create a community where we do SDG impact assessments of all kinds of activities, and then share and learn, it, learn from that. So we're looking for some funding for that. Please talk to me afterwards if you have any thoughts on that. And with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. We now have our speaker from SDSN Sahel, Hamad Nyai. Uh, welcome to the stage. 
Good evening, everybody. Can we imagine it is my first presentation in English? So I will try. <laughs> so what I will share today is an uh, experience that uh, in implementing project in UN project in Africa. So I will start at the last sentence. Sustainable <coughs> development need good and available data plus funding. If you have funding and we don't have good data for to implement project, it's why many projects are uh, uh, lost at the beginning. So the objective of this project is to build a big database that is based on the good and updated data. So the challenge is, our challenge is to build, a, to make available quality and updated data in a real time. The importance of the challenge is the, to correct the socioeconomic inequality, like in this picture. Other things is better direct investment funding in a sustainable way. When the good information is known, things can change, like this picture as shown. This health, this health poster in 2014, after two years when the information is known. So the concern about the implementation of the project is the availability of the request equipment and adequate financial resources. The first question that sparked our curiosity is, are there availability an updated database that can be used for the national development plan and the SDGs. For that, the project involves a number of stakeholders and experts like governor, state technical services, and civil societies. So the lesson learned is the inclusion of all development stakeholders to answer that no one is left behind. It's very important for the sustainability of the project. It's very important against the unexpected about the project about and the mistake is using regional and developmental and developmental data to implement project. The big problem or the big challenge we have in Africa Implementing pro uh, project on the local level, they use the data from the, uh, from the regional level that they use for to implement project in the local level. And it not shows the reality. It is why we have many, pro many problems for uh, the final evaluation in the project. The solution is to adopt the bottom up. It is a methodology that we propose that give quality and true information from the population at the local level. So the essential learning is localizing the relevant <coughs> indicator before starting the project. It is very important. It can reduce data collection time and financial cost. The result obtained are the identification, the location, and the validation of indicator like we did, like we did in one region in Senegal named Jurbel. During this session, we collaborated with the Bombay University and all the state technical services. So the other result obtained is the stabilization of the tools. The quantification of our result is the consensus of the methodology that used to implement the project. All technical services accept the methodology. It, it's very good, it's very important for monitoring the project. A multi-sectoral database and up-to-date is available after doing the project. The tool for data collection and monitoring evaluation are available. The discovery that can be used to inform the work of other is the location of, indica of indicator for all stakeholders, 
it can help for implementing project. <coughs> the stabilization of tool that is accessible to all. This work can be applied on local planning and for updating national development plan. It can be used against for fiscal recover. Three months ago, we support one community, one local community to recover their fiscality. It can help some time to implement some project. So the advance of this knowledge, it can be used by university for research and anybody who work on development project. Sorry for that. Ah, I'm sorry. So for the support, we need financial and sometimes technical support improving tools. What I want to say as final is many projects are implementing in Africa, but are condemned to fail from the outset due to the lack, due to the lack of quality data from the beginning of the project implementation. It's why I will share, I will ask the audience or participants to adopt and support the bottom-up methodology for more success in project because it is information from the population needs. At the end, for to build on the success, we success government, NGO, to integrate this methodology into national development plan at lower cost, with real-time monitoring and immediate impact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hamad Lian. Um, our last speaker is Manuel Almestar from SDS in Spain. Um, do remember to use Slido, so slide.do, and then the code is N977. Just seven minutes more. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. My name is Manuel Almestar. I'm an architect and facilitator from Peru. And, and I now live in Spain. I'm working at the Innovation and Technology for Development Center of Techni Technical University of Madrid, ITUPM. This is an open innovation platform that integrates researchers and students and professors working in a collaboration with different stakeholders. We aim to address significant social technical problems uh, to co-create new solutions around the, SD the SDGs. We work closely with SDSN Spain, and that's the reason what I'm here today. Um, I remember three years ago when, when I moved in to Madrid to study and to work at the, at the Innovation Center, my former professor and now my boss told me that I'm not an architect, that I'm a facilitator. I thought that it's a, a huge problem because, this is my name, um, this is a huge problem because I am designer and what is a facilitator? At the beginning of this new role to me, we faced a new challenge. How can we work in different ways with our city, Madrid? Madrid and Madrid City Council and Technical University have been working together for more than 10 years, but in a specific commitment such as studies or assessment. We thought that instead our advices or recommendations uh, and a campaign was necessary. So we asked ourselves, how can universities be more effective in addressing complex real world city problems? And this is what I want to show you, not just the, the, the pathway to let me understand my new role, but also uh, a practical example of how we accompany through our municipality in solving some of its climate issues. The result is Madrid Sustainable Innovation Platform, Platform Cities. This is an experimental and interdisciplinary platform addressing these questions. It aims to deliver a proper context to provoke a sustainable and systemic transformation in Madrid. Madrid, with 3.2 million inhabitants, is facing with another big cities, serious problems to tackle air pollution. Madrid has failed year after year since 2010 in meeting 
uh, the air quality standards established by the European Union. Because of that, it's, it's urgent to focus on improving the climate conditions of the city. Platform Cities focuses on Madrid's local policy for air quality and climate change. This platform has a core team integrated by Technical University of Madrid but as a facilitator, providing a connecting tissue for provoking, accelerating, and sustaining transformative collaboration among different disciplines and actors. The Madrid City Council, the challenge owner, guiding and generating public policies that respond to societal needs. Matadero Madrid, the public center for contemporary creation, amplifying the links with citizens and promoting the co-creation of new narratives through artistic representations. This platform is also involving a wider range of organizations. They are working in an iterative and non-lineal process based on social innovation platforms where the ecosystem work together through different stages to establish the most suitable solution. Platform Cities works in three different challenges, monitoring, mitigation, and adaptation to climate change. The first challenge is to improve and to strengthen the current network of air quality sensors installed and to generate new ways to, to transform this data in relevant information for citizens. The second challenge is about reduction emission. On one hand, we are working on the, on the improvement of the public APP called Mas Madrid to increase mobility efficiency. On the other hand, we are working on the, on the um, um, there is a process of collective intelligence using a platform called UPM. This is an open data online platform that facilitates the collaborative ideation of solutions for city sustainability challenges. The first contest involved more than 2,000 people co-creating about the sustainable mobility. The third challenge is based on the adaptation to climate change. The first pilot is Matadero Mutant Action, which uses Matadero, the Center for Contemporary Creation, based in an old slaughterhouse, as a test bed for applying nature-based solutions in a process leading by artists. Five group of artists and more than 150 students, 500 volunteers and more than 15 organizations involved build prototypes to suggest new uses or new perspectives of the public space. And they are, uh, these prototypes will suggest new, new ways to talk about the climate crisis. First prototypes are currently on display in an international exhibition called Ecovisionarius. During these years, we have tested our critical design principles. Working in platforms instead of projects. Creating a context of confidence. Linking diversity actors to unlock barriers. Working with the challenge owner and citizens and designing for scalability. Next steps will focus on amplifying the scope of Madrid platform. To achieve this, we are working with another 14 cities in the deep demonstration program of the EIT Climate Kick. The aim of this program is to build real experiments at city scale to support acceleration to the 2030 climate targets. Let me conclude by saying that through this platform, I return to design, design a context, a spaces to talk and create. Through this platform, we don't want to get the different uh, participating organizations outside their comfort zone. We want to expand it and discover that it's possible to, to work together to amplify the impact and to create a vibrant ecosystem where the resolution of those problems is possible. For that reason, when I, at the beginning of this speech, I, I tell you that I'm not just an architect, I'm a facilitator too. I stop designing physical spaces to design spaces of collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel. So I'm going to invite all of our speakers uh, to the stage, I'll call it. 
Um, and we're going to use Lido to answer some questions. So yes, please, all of you, join us. So, so the first question, or the most voted question, uh, it reads something like, give us a tweet about what we need to achieve the SDGs. So I think we can translate that to what, what would be the two phrases of how to achieve the SDGs. Do any of you want to start? <laughs> I would say that if you want to achieve different results, you must be willing um, and uh, have the courage to do things you have never done before. I think global partnership. 2015 uh, was a call to action. Today is a call to acceleration. Make everyone aware that a desirable future is possible. Wonderful, Martin. Yes, I'm uh, compulsive, uh, positive. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> how to say. Uh, I, I can do it. I can. It's possible to, to change. I would say that we would need everybody to get more engaged, uh, not only big corporations and so, as I said, but we also need brave political leadership. Yeah, I say understanding where we are, knowing where we want to go. I would say to be the change. What you want to see in the world is a change. I would say humility and asking the right questions. I think you have to involve all the population. Yeah, I think we need to translate awareness into action. Maybe uh, reduce the tolerance level for wrongdoings, and more affirmative action and encouragement for doing the right thing. Wonderful, thank you. Um, a, a specific question for you, Laura. So how have the KPIs been selected and do you think that they are replicable for other ports? So I think, I start from the bottom. Uh, so I think that the model could be really, re is replicable. But the important thing that we have to remember is that uh, we are localizing the agenda. So it's replicable, the model itself, but we must know where we are and what is the state of the art of the situation. So knowing better and in the best way where we are, so which are the particular and much more relevant uh, objective for this future, not maybe not the really far future, but even the near future could be relevant in order to shape the correct way, I mean the correct um, way to sustainability. Regarding the KPIs, as mm, been a real uh, job together with those who plan the strategy for the future, the strategy for the future. So the selection is not been only on the base of uh, numbers and available data, but also a little bit more than this. Wonderful, thanks. Also a question uh, for Megina, so if yeah. you could pass the microphone. Mm -hmm. um, how, rep uh, sorry, no. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I've lost that question. Could other Caribbean countries replicate your project? Yeah, um, many of the Caribbean countries have a rum industry um, because it was similar histories, different colonizers and different sequence, but many Caribbean islands and countries in that region have a rum industry and a problem with discarding of the rum industry waste and also a sargassum seaweed problem and a tourism problem because of sargassum seaweed on beaches. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we have two suggestions. One is that the SDG impact tool should be used for all of these solutions, yeah. which seems like a, a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> There's also another solution, both Africa, uh, sorry, another proposal. Both African solutions have to do with data. So this uh, anonymous writer says that there is perhaps an opportunity to collaborate between these two networks. Um, and perhaps just a final question to anyone that wants to address it. So what do we want to learn in the process of working towards the SDGs? Anyone wants to? Karina? Uh, I, I want to speak in Spanish uh, uh, because it's more comfortable for me. Uh, <coughs> thank you. 
Bueno, el aprendizaje, las lecciones aprendidas de trabajar en los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible es que nos colocan eh, como visión el poder eh, trabajar eh, cosas concretas, poder so tener soluciones concretas y también entender de que el desafío no solamente es global, sino principalmente podemos aportar desde lo pequeño, desde adentro, desde nuestras propias soluciones, desde nuestros propios conocimientos y también eh, entender de que hay muchas cosas que se están haciendo bien y que necesitamos también justamente esta red ¿m? para ver cómo sumamos y cómo generamos mayor impacto desde lo local hasta lo global. Please translate. <risa> So I, I will translate word by word. Um, so um, Karina believes that the, the local is as important as uh, the big projects and that um, it is through networks like this one that we find out the power of these small projects that actually add up to, to great achievements. It was a bit of a summary. <laughs> Anyone else uh, has? Yes. Well, um, the SDGs have actually brought all countries uh, to the same level. Every country is developing. Uh, you have climate issues, you have inequality issues, you have uh, issues about environmental pollution. So every country needs SDG, and it's a leveler for all of us. I would say that we need to learn to think a little bit out of the box and stop working in silos. I think that's what we need to learn, to operate outside our specific fields uh, and collaborate. Uh, it's not, it might sound, sound trivial, but that's actually quite difficult. So we need to learn that. Uh, can I say, we need to learn how the local um, the balance between local approaches and blanket approaches and where it begins and where it ends. There's a fine line. But a lot of these solutions had localness to them and still global relevance. So, yeah. I would say it's important to be brave enough and to have courage to address the root cause of the problems rather than to look at the surface because many of what we are currently addressing is just the symptoms and there is a deeper layers of what the problems are in our society and that's what we try to address in our presentation. And I would maybe just add to that 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 involves a great deal of also not only looking outside but looking inwards and what's there and how can we improve that in order to then have the ripple effect that we wish to see outside. I would also say that SDGs are a huge opportunity to realize the systemic uh, perspective of the, of the challenges. You can be expert on one field, on one topic, but you will never be an expert of the whole 17 SDGs. So partnership is really a key word. We have to work together to achieve this uh, agenda. Well, thank you very much. Um, perhaps a, a last round of, of applause to our, our 10 networks represented here. We have uh, <laughs> Professor Jeffrey Sachs has just joined us to deliver some closing remarks. <laughs> you, you, you are in. Uh, keep talking for a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I will talk a little bit more. So, um, anyone wants to talk <laughs> for a couple of minutes? <laughs> Good. <laughs> but in Spanish, translate, please. <laughs> Hay algo que tenemos súper claro los que trabajamos en la Amazonía eh, y es que los bosques son nuestra mayor inversión o me, y la conservación, no, es nuestro mayor activo y la conservación es nuestra mejor inversión. Podemos generar recursos, podemos generar bienestar, podemos generar economía con los bosques en pie ya no podemos cortar más. Así que vamos con esa fuerza todos, porque los bosques eh, cuentan con nosotros.
in Peru. So I, uh, yeah. so I was going to say that uh, even if you did not understand the language, I think you, you must have, it came, the passion came across. Uh, and what Karina was saying is that we need the forests not just to, uh, to live, but also because of all of what they produce, all of the ecosystem services that they provide. And so she was saying, we cannot cut a single tree more. Uh, Martin, I think you wanted to add something else? I just want to thank you and the other ones who have made this event possible. Uh, all the estates and staff that has done this. I think it's been amazing, fantastic. And uh, if there's any more to come in the future, I'm looking forward to those. Thanks again. Thank all right, so do you want to sure. come <laughs> join us? <laughs> Wow. How are you? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I've been running so much uh, for the last three days that I haven't had a chance to say hello uh, and uh, haven't had a chance to hear all of the wonderful things that uh, the solution winners uh, have brought, but I have read about the individual projects and I will get further briefed in the next couple of days by having the chance to be with you. We're moving, for me, my calendar is now moving into the SDSN phase because it's been the General Assembly uh, and uh, going back and forth to the UN. Um, and we're on the west side and they're on the east side. And so it's been a, a lot of transport uh, in, in the last three days. Let me just say a, a little bit about uh, what I've seen uh, during the General Assembly, uh, basically global society, global academia, that's a lot of us, uh, and uh, global business is way ahead of the politicians in general. Uh, and maybe I got the worst dose of politicians in the morning uh, yesterday because the General Assembly opened with two of the worst politicians on the planet. Uh, <laughs> Bolsonaro first, who gave a perfectly awful talk. Uh, and then, uh, if you can imagine worse, we have a Trump uh, who gave an even worse talk. Although I have a sneaking suspicion that both talks were written by the same person, actually. <laughs> and I think that that may literally be true because there were certain nasty themes that permeated both speeches about national sovereignty and nations and anti-globalism and a bunch of nonsense. But the day ended well with the opening of impeachment proceedings against uh, <laughs> President Trump. Uh, which he richly deserved for that awful speech that he gave. Uh, and um, I felt pretty good about that. And what I've also felt quite good about is how many solutions are being developed right now. You are doing wonderful work uh, in solutions uh, across many different fields. Uh, and many different local realities. And this is also very important because local context, culture, ecology, geography affects uh, the uh, kinds of solutions that make sense. And this is uh, at the essence of the whole notion of a global network of solutions that you're finding them, sharing them, and making it possible for others to learn. And we've had a wonderful day also of businesses talking about solutions. And that is very, very exciting for me. Uh, I just arrived from a fantastic discussion with the, the Swedish company Scania, uh, which makes big trucks. Uh, and they're completely committed to decarbonizing their fleet and even though I do almost nothing but talk about this subject morning, noon, and night, every day, seven days a week, uh, 52 weeks of the year, I learned a lot in the last few minutes from what this company is doing. 
I'm going to show you a picture, actually. I, maybe this is so obvious to you, but I've never seen it before. You know, one of the big puzzles is how do you make large trucks uh, zero emission? We know for vehicles, light-duty vehicles, that electrification is uh, almost surely the right way. But for large trucks, the problem is that uh, the uh, size of batteries right now, given uh, the uh, uh, battery performance, takes up too much room and it's non-economical. And so there's a problem of electrification of large vehicles that uh, is basically solved for light-duty vehicles. And uh, so I was asking, and they have a perfectly sensible solution that I've never actually thought about, which is you can't quite see it, but it's a giant truck being like a city trolley with the over, uh, over highway uh, grid. We don't have that anywhere in the United States, as far as I know, uh, anywhere tried. And it's only at the beginning in Europe. But what a smart, straightforward idea which is you don't need the batteries uh, if you uh, have the green electricity uh, powering the highway system. And uh, what the CEO of Scania was explaining to me is that 80% or so of their heavy freight is on a very small proportion of the roads, which is basically the highway system. Uh, so if you just devote one lane of the highways, you can actually create uh, a corridor that is zero emission with existing technologies. Uh, and it's a wonderful solution. And I said, oh, and if you've got that one corridor, they can also be autonomous. And Glint in his eye, yes, that's part of the plan too, uh, so that we can move to autonomy of vehicles at the same time. And along that corridor can also be what you need for that, which is 5G, uh, a heavy concentration of access. So suddenly you've made the transport corridor wonderfully uh, efficient and green, and the technologies are obviously within reach. And I confess, I hadn't thought about that uh, as a solution. I imagined that it would have to be a hydrogen fuel cell solution or further advances on batteries. And then I asked, what do you do within the cities? And he answered, well, within the cities, we're already all electric. This is uh, basically the answer even for freight uh, because it's uh, local uh, transport. But then he explained that uh, to make the cities work better, you could cut down tremendously on the number of trucks within the cities because most of the trucks are carrying a very small fraction of their potential load. And with digitization of the information about which freight is going where, it's possible to make a perimeter around the city that the big trucks are coming in and they're transferring uh, the freight into a very small number of electric vehicles, because that's what the digital information will allow. And I asked, well, could that be automatic also? He said, yes, that's what we're doing. So that can be autonomously uh, done, because they have a modular design of uh, how the freight is uh, going to be uh, built on top of uh, the, the, the transport uh, um, infrastructure. So, Fantastic things can be done once we have the determination and the knowledge to do it. We heard earlier today at the conference from another fantastic company. Uh, I don't know if uh, any of you was at the discussion with Pat Brown uh, of Impossible Foods, uh, but he had the very bright idea that given the extraordinary burden of beef consumption on the planet to uh, make uh, what is surely a new term, and that is plant-based meat. Uh, er, plant, yeah, plant-based meat. So he just calls it meat. Uh, but they're making meat products uh, out of plants uh, and uh, for impossible foods. Uh, 
the breakthrough that they've had with the beef is to get an extremely strong uh, taste of beef into this plant-based uh, food by uh, heme protein, uh, which was uh, the result of uh, their research work that the heme protein gives a lot of the taste uh, to uh, beef, and it can be uh, produced uh, by uh, yeast, in fact, I think it is uh, for impossible foods, uh, and then put into a plant-based protein. And the implications of that for easing the burden on the physical environment are absolutely startling. Uh, I only had a small part of the imagination of all of the different dimensions of ecological pressure that will be relieved from this, including an obvious point that we should remember that I would have forgotten on a first pass through this, which is that the amount of antibiotics being used in beef production is so high that it is one of the absolutely dire risks of creating mass resistance to uh, large classes of uh, antibiotics, and that the pressure, therefore, of moving to a uh, plant-based meat diet uh, would also have implications such as vastly reduced industrial uses of antibiotics and, therefore, vastly prolonging the usefulness and life of the antibiotics. But that was just one of the many aspects of the solution that he offered. We also had the Vice President of Sustainability of 3M, which is a major materials uh, company in the United States about all of the different ways that their products are being redesigned and reconfigured to be sustainable. So we should feel quite optimistic, actually. Uh, technological solutions plus impeachment will get us the sustainable <laughs> development goals. So I think we're getting very, very close. Uh, thank you for organizing uh, this uh, wonderful solutions uh, group. Uh, I know in each country how happy uh, the, the response was. So congratulations to all of you for the fantastic work that you're doing. You're really heroes of the SDGs. We will make your solutions known and spread. That's a core part of our network. And thanks to all of you for your leadership. Thanks. Thank you. So now we invite you all to have a drink and something to eat with us. And reach out to our speakers once again if you have any further questions. <laughs>